Okay, so welcome to another class in the brain spaces. And today we will be talking about um, a proof of the prime number theorem using uh, the Talberian method, which is uh, often uh, uh, invoking the Vida uh, Ikehara theorem. But I'm going to present a version of, let's say, a, a nice version of the Vina Ikehara theorem using um, some special functions created in uh, paper Vina spaces. So before we start, I want just to recall the prime number theorem. So let's see part one. Uh, So there are lots of ways to prove the prime number theorem, but the Dalberian approach is kind of nice because it's a very general statement. And uh, one could regard this as the reason why the prime number theorem works. And you will see in a moment. So, uh, so one of the functions that we use in prime number theory is counting, counting primes in a certain interval, let's say. So say we sum all the primes P, so P will always be a prime, so P prime, let's see, a positive prime, let's say greater equal than two. So that's the prime counting function. Another related object is the psi function which summates over all the integers n, less or equal than x and greater or equal than one. And it summates the von Mongold function, gamma n. So what's the von Mongold function? Um, gamma n equals log of p if n is some prime power and zero otherwise. Okay, and why this function is important, this Vermongold function is important. Well, it's just because if you if you take your zeta function, yeah, always define for real part of s greater than one by this representation. If you take the zeta function and you take its log derivative, let's say minus its log derivative. And this is also a Dirichlet function or Dirichlet series, and is just given by the von Mongold function. Okay, it's a, a nice computation you can do, um, and 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 that's important because of that. So the prime number theorem is the statement. Let me use blue. So the prime number theorem is what? Is the statement that P, the prime counting function grows as X divided by log X. Okay. So the number of primes up to X is roughly around X uh, divided by log X. So if you um, take the number of primes up to x and divide. Um, so if you want to measure the gap, you take x and divide by i. No, you take uh, um, the number. Yes, yeah, so, so the density of primes is like one over log x. That's what I'm saying. Uh, so an equivalent statement is, uh, is it or equivalently. the psi function grows like x. So why is that an equivalent? 
um, statement. Yes. So why is that an equivalent statement? Let's see that. So this actually is a nice computation. Um, um, so let's do first one side. Oops. Why? Why this is equivalent statement? Well, if you take the, your function psi of x, so what is that? Well, we are trying to. Uh, so what is your function psi? Let me go back here. Yeah, so that's your function psi. So it always counts log p whenever you see a prime power. So you're trying to know uh, if p to the a is less or equal than x. If that's the case, then you have to add a log p to the summation. But that happens if and only if a is less or equal than log of x divided by log of p. But a is an integer, so that happens. So that's exactly what we need to do. So this would be summation of all primes less or equal than x of how many times do we have to add log p to it? How many times do we have to put log p? Well, these many times, a times log p. Okay. So that's what happens. So then a simple bound is just to say that this is less or equal than log x. You just remove that integer part here. And then will be just log x summation of p less or equal than x of one. So that's exactly the prime counting function, pi of x. Okay, so then, so then if you divide both sides, We conclude. Uh, yes. So if pi of x grows like this, at least you get an upper bound of the right side size for phi a psi of x divided by x. But that's one side of the inequality. We can make another another side as well. Um, um, suppose I want to summate, let's say, log p from in an interval, let's say, from x to alpha primes less than this, when alpha is some given number, let's say, alpha, um, alpha is some number greater than zero and less than one. Okay. Suppose you want to do that. Okay. Well, that will be. Um, so you're summating log p. Well, the, the smallest possible number in here would be um, exactly uh, x to the alpha. So you can bound this below by log x, alpha, log x. And then you will get just summation of one x alpha less than p less or equal than x. And that's just a difference of two prime counting functions. So they would be just pi of x minus pi of x to the alpha. Okay. On the other hand, you could just bound this from below, from above, say the same function here from above by just, well, including the terms that I'm summating up to here, and I'm summating, well, log p for a prime. So if I summate log p for prime power, that will definitely get more. So I could just bound this by the both of psi of x. So therefore you get that psi of x divided by x is greater or equal than alpha log x divided by x of this thing. Okay, but actually the second part here is going to zero. This bit here is going to zero. So let me rewrite this as alpha 
log x divided by x, pi of x plus, let's say, minus, it's greater or equal than minus, say, alpha um, we write that alpha log x divided by um, let's say divided by x to all one minus alpha. So I'm just bounding pi of x to the alpha by x to the alpha. Okay, then then you get a lower bound. And then we get this thing here. So when x goes to infinity, this thing goes to zero because alpha is less than one. Okay, so these two inequalities um, show that, uh, so let me see, let me put the number here, one and two. So, um, one and two show that, uh, let's say the limb soup and x goes to infinity equals, um, well, is, is, is greater or equal than, um, well, they are all equal. The point is when, whenever you have this, this, and that. So we uh, uh, we don't know if the sequence converges yet, but we can definitely guarantee that if this, uh, sorry, if the limit phi of x, psi of x divided by x, we don't know if it converges, but if, uh, but if it does, it has the same limit. And also with the limb inf. Um, so, we, so, so let me say roughly like this. See if it becomes easier. But you can phrase, phrase this in terms of limit in seven soups. Okay. So that statement means that uh, this guy means that, well, if one limit exists, the other exists and it has the same value. So that's what these inequalities show. So yes, so indeed the prime number theorem, which is this statement, is equivalent of showing this. Okay, and, that, and that's what we, we, we are going to prove. Okay, so how, how can we prove that? Actually, in, with the Wiener and Ikehara theorem, you can give a proof very easily. Um, so how can we show that psi of x grows like x? Well, we do know that the information we need lies in the minus the log derivative of the zeta function. So if the real part of S is greater than one, what is that? That is just a summation of gamma of n, n to the S, n from one to infinity. So actually, so what are we doing here? Let me put, make a graph here. If this is n, which is a prime power, then my function, my function has a jump. And this jump here is gamma of n, which is log of p. So that red thing is the graph of the function uh, psi of x. So if x is, um, sorry, if x is a prime power, then I will have a jump because I'm summating up to x as soon as I see a prime power uh, x, I will have to jump by log of the prime power, okay? So if I take, so this is a an increasing function. So if I take the, the derivative of that in the, in the still sense, which we saw in some classes ago when we talked about uh, the Poisson representation formula. So if I take the derivative of that function, I have some delta functions at these points, okay? So then you realize that you can rewrite this sum as an integral of x minus s of d psi of x. 
in the Stilts uh, integral sense, Riemann Stilts integral, when you take the derivative. So this will become a measure and a bunch of deltas exactly at the point when we have, when you want to evaluate this x to be minus n. Again, this one minus means that I am integrating from the interval one to infinity and I'm taking values from the left, meaning I'm including the, the one. Okay, so you write it like this. And then the Vina Ikehara theorem just solves the, the, the issue completely. So that would be theorem M. Uh, let say let alpha be let's say alpha from zero to infinity to uh, the real line be non-decreasing and assume we don't need to assume that but uh, just for simplicity assume that it starts with zero. Okay, which is the case of this psi guy here, because at zero, we don't have anything. Um, let, and then we compute F, which will be capital F, which will be its Laplace transform. Yeah, let me write in terms of T, like this. So I compute it to Laplace transform and I, I will assume let F be of, of, of the alpha and assume it converges Absolutely, uh, for the real part of S when the real part of S is greater than R, for some number R positive. Okay, so what's the picture here again? So the picture is you have here your x axis, you have here the number R, and on this bit here, the thing converts absolutely and therefore defines an analytic function. In that in that uh, semi uh, semi space, okay. And then you assume assume that the only reason why we can't evaluate at the boundary. Let me put the boundary in red. Is because we have a pole in here. So assume that for some a positive f of s minus a s minus r is continuous uh, for real part of s greater or equal than r. Okay, that means it extends continuously up to the boundary when we do the subtraction. When we remove the pole, you can go up to the boundary. Then, alpha of x grows like e to rx times a constant, and that constant will be the residue of the pole divided by r. And this notation, again, just to recall, this notation means that we divide the left-hand side with the right-hand side and take the limit when x goes to infinity, that limit goes to one. Okay, so that's the Vinay Kehara thing. So what, what this shows, so, so the application is, is, is simple. So, let me see. So what's the application? Well, the application would be simple. 
if you go back to the prime number theorem and now you have the Wiener Ikehara result, well, this guy here is the Laplace transform of a certain non-decreasing function, the psi function, which we want to know uh, if it goes uh, like uh, x. So I have to rewrite this. Let me even rewrite it in here. Let me move this bit here. This bit here. You can just, just do a change of variables and that would be integral from zero minus to infinity or e to the minus st. Um, yeah, let me put this in terms of t. t and then d phi of e to the t. That would be zero minus. Okay, this is just a simple change of variables. So indeed, this guy is the Laplace transform of a certain measure. You just put this new variable and this function, well, it's known that the zeta function, the only problem with it is that it has a pole at the point one and the residue of that pole is one. So, uh, so indeed, so indeed, minus eta prime of s divided the log derivative, if I remove one of minus s minus one, this is, is uh, uh, entire. Okay. Um, oh, not exactly entire, this is, sorry, that's wrong. This is, um, uh, it is continuous up to the boundary. It's even a bit more, but anyway, is because we know that the zeta function doesn't have zeros at the real part of s equals one. So, so we have here, this is one. The zeta doesn't have zeros here. So if I remove the only pole, but it has here, Okay, the zeros of the zeta could contribute as poles. When you take the log derivative, the zeros become poles. So there are a bunch of zeros here, or they're supposed to be a line, but we don't know that. But we definitely know that there is a zero free region close to this line one. So there is here the line one, and there is a zero free region here. So we even know that we can move a little, like in a neighborhood of the line of this guy here. We still have a, analytic, uh, the, the, this one can still analytic, which is even a bit more than what the, the theorem requires. But anyway, so then by, by, by the Vinay-Kihara theorem, I mean, it's direct. Then we have that psi of e to the t, behaves like, well, the pole is one, so it should be one, r is one, so one divided by one, and then e to t, as t goes to infinity. I change it to t here. Which is the same as to say that psi of x grows as x, and then the prime number theorem follows. Okay, any questions here so far? So bottom, bottom line is um, you want to show that psi of x grows as x, that is equivalent to the prime number theorem. And what should take the log derivative of the zeta function you have these representations, it's a Laplace transform of the, the derivative of this function you want to measure, you want to estimate. And there is this very general theorem that gives that estimate for free, okay? So what you're going to see today is there is, there is different proofs of the Vinay-Kihara theorem. Um, you're going to see today is an, a, a 
bit out of the box proof, which is not very well known, but it's, it gives even further, so further information. So, so you could ask, so you could ask uh, what happens. So you have your function here. So the plus transform of something it converges in this plane here. You could ask the question, what well, maybe I do have a pole in here, good, but maybe I have another pole in here and another pole in here. What can I say then? Um, so, so if I remove this pole here and I don't remove these other two, let's say, then the function doesn't extend continuously up to the boundary of this, up to this line. So maybe it only extends continuously up to a certain segment of this line. Can I still say something? And it, the answer is actually yes. What you can say is you can see an inequality. You could say that this thing is less or equal than something that grows like this and greater or equal than something that grows like this. But the constants won't be exactly the same. So you can come up with upper and lower bounds for this. You can even say, I'm not gonna show because it's just the same thing, but a bit more complicated. You can even like have a bunch of poles here and then you remove a bunch of these poles, but you still have other ones. So you only extend the function continuously up to here, even if removing like, let's say a hundred poles and you still get some sort of inequality uh, with some oscillating terms. Okay. And in the limited case, when you can send this segment to cover the whole line, but you recover the Wiener Ikehara result. Okay. So that's what I'm gonna show. So the, the question is what happens? When we have multiple poles, was a multiple singularity. So that would be part two. So now we we're going to do before we we see how can we deal with that. We have to build some background. To, we have to construct some special functions. And in the third part, we will glue the, the, the first and second seconds, sections together and prove the, uh, a generalization of the Vina Ikehara theorem. Okay, so that part would be minor and like, uh, one-sided approximation. Approximation of the two P's, maybe. Probably not. Um, so the functions we want to approximate are the, as these truncated Gaussians, which is the kernel of the Laplace transform. So for now, we will define this function as. If X is positive, it's just this Gaussian and it's, and it's zero if X is less or equal than zero. Okay, so the, the plot is, this is X. So it's just zero up to this point. And then in the case, this is one. And then in the case explanation. Okay, so what I want to build is a function, let's say in green, that lies above this one, and a function, let's say, in orange, that lies below this one. So let's say uh, M, is less or equal than this e lambda x, which is less or equal than this capital M. Okay, I want to build two auxiliary functions like this, and I want them to be band limited. So I want 
the Fourier transform of both this little m and capital M um, to be um, supported in the interval minus one, one. That is, I want them to be of exponential type two pi. So, so I want to build M, zero M and capital M, both in the paley Venus space, and one paley Venus space of exponential type two pi, that is the support of M and M of the Fourier transforms containing the L minus one, one. And such that the integral of M lies above, capital M lies above my function. So the natural question is to such that this is minimal. So the function that lies above, I want to reduce the integral as much as possible. I know that the integral has to be greater or equal than the integral of that function. Okay, but can I reduce it as much as possible? And the same similar question for little m. Well, it lies below, so the integral will be less or equal than this. But can I maximize the integral? Okay. So that is the problem. And you can already see the connection because this is the kernel of the Laplace transform um, because this lambda is any real number. So it should say, uh, it should say here, lambda is some positive that. So it's in the kernel of the Laplace transform. So these functions would be helpful. Okay, so let me show how we can solve these problems. And one thing is very easy is to come up with optimal lower and upper bounds. Okay, so I do know, so let's say for little m. So say, so let's say take m, little m, okay. We know that it, we have Poisson summation. But um, little m is supported in the interval minus one, one. Okay. So outside minus one, one, this thing will be zero. But also at the point minus one and at the point one, m hat will be zero because m is L1. So it's Fourier transform is continuous. So if it vanishes outside the interval minus one, one, it has to vanish at the point minus one, one as well. So the only term that remains is n hat at zero, which is exactly this, this thing here. Which is the thing that I want to maximize for the little m. But I do know that this guy here supposedly lies below that exponential function. So then I conclude that this is less or equal than the sum from n starting from, let's say from one, because since it's less or equal than a function at zero is also less or equal than zero. So we'll drop all these values here, which are less or equal than zero, and only take those ones and that those ones are bound by the exponential. So it will be just minus lambda n. And that is what? That is one divided by e lambda minus one. Is this the series is summable. So there we go. You know that m hat of zero is less or equal than this. Okay. So it's it's not even it's less or m lies below this guy. So definitely it's less than the integral, which is one over lambda, but it's worse than that. It's less than this number. This number is less than one over lambda. Okay, so that's the upper bound. Can we meet that upper bound? Can we make that upper bound sharp? And the question is, and the answer is yes. Uh, equality is attained. Well, 
Well, if and only if all the terms that are dropped here are actually uh, not in, uh, uh, not uh, uh, making this inequality uh, not sharp. So that means uh, the zero terms that are dropped are actually zero. So that means that M of N has to be zero for N less so equal than uh, zero. And M of N has to be equal to E minus lambda N for N greater or equal than one. Okay, that's if and only if, but if that is the case, then we actually have more because since the function lies below, so that's the graph again. The function lies below, if it touches, the derivative has to be zero. The same thing here, if it touches, the derivative here has to follow the derivative of the function above. So therefore, m prime at n has to be zero for what? n less or equal to minus one, because the, only, the problem at zero is that, well, the derivative doesn't necessarily need to be zero here. It could be something like this. The function could be doing something like this. So here we only have vanishing, not vanishing of second order. But we do have, we do know the other ones. This has to be the derivative of that guy, which would be minus lambda e minus lambda n, if n is greater or equal than one. Okay, so now we have a system. Okay, I want to build a function with these properties. And moreover, you see that if you build a function with exactly these properties, and you guess correctly what the derivative here it should be, that's still left to be solved. But if you guess correctly what the derivative here should be, and also you can create a function with this prescribed values, that would be optimal, okay? Because it's if and only if. But you should still have to check if the function really lies below. Because if you build a function like this, it's not guaranteed that it will lie below. But if it does lie below this kernel E and has these properties, then it will be automatically optimal and the integral of M will be maximized, okay? So how can we do that? And that is one of the things that I already explained in one of the classes. That's via these interpolation formulas. So the key here is interpolation. Which is a similar formula from this channel uh, interpolation formula, but uh, uses derivatives. So what is the, the thing if you have an F in beta v one of exponential type two pi, then there is an interpolation formula for it. You sum over all the integers and that's the formula pi z minus n, pi z minus n squared and then here the derivative. minus n, and moreover, you, there is a converse. Conversely, uh, as long as you take, let's say, a sequence a n and a sequence b n, both uh, uh, little l one, that means if you summate the absolute values, this is a is finite, then you can just BN. Oops. 
So what I mean is, well, for every function in this space, you have this formula. This formula converges in L1 and also in the formula in compact sets. And conversely, just give me any two sequences, which are in a little L1. That means it's a sum of the absolute values is finite. And I just plug in these values here. That will give me a function. That series will converge in the norm of this Taylor genus space and will define a function there. So you can prescribe. So the problem of prescribing this thing is not really a problem. This is a known technique. The issue is showing that um, the function m prescribed by these values really lies below that guy. If it does, then it will be optimal by this computation here involving Poisson summation. Um, so what would be the, the, this guy? So if you write, so M of Z should be N greater or equal than one, E minus lambda N, these has to be the values. And the derivative is minus lambda E minus lambda N. And there's still uh, the value at the origin, which we, it has to be zero. At the origin, it has to be zero, but we don't know what the derivative is at the origin. So it could be anything. So it should be some A, which we don't know. Okay. And we have to choose what, what A is. So it turns out that there is exactly one A that works. And um, M indeed lies below this guy. Okay, and if it lies below by the calculation we did again, it's optimal, okay? and its integral will be this value. This m is optimal in the sense that that its integral equals one over minus lambda one is maximal among all the functions satisfying the same properties. Means lying below the, the exponential and uh, being of uh, exponential type two pi. Okay, and a similar computation can be done with uh, similarly, there will be a unique M um, lying above the guy and the integral is minimal and is actually e lambda e lambda minimal is minimal and actually you can even write what m is m is actually just a little guy plus a sink squared because if you go through the properties that M, capital M should satisfy is almost the same, except that at the origin here, capital M should be one, okay? And then you realize, well, so, so then you must have the same thing plus uh, the value at the origin, which would be given by this term here with N equals zero. So it's a sink squared. So in the end, you can show that actually you have this. That's the relation. So if you find little m, it's easy to find capital L and capital M and vice versa. Okay. Good. So any questions in here?
So now we can move to part three, is that you use these functions to, um, to prove the Vinay-Kihara term or, or a general version of it. And all of this is following um, a paper of Graham and Waller. So let me write here. A class of extremal functions for the Fourier transform. And this is a paper of Graham and Waller. Okay. And one of the theorems is the following. Um, let alpha again from zero to infinity be non decreasing uh, again let's normalize at the order to p zero it's not necessary but anyway and assume it's Laplace transform Again, the same statements, the same initial part as the Vinay Kihara result, and assume converges absolutely for a real part of S greater than some number R. And then it comes uh, the weakening of the assumption. Assume for some A positive, when you remove the pole, this is continuous in the set real part of S greater or equal to zero. So it extends continuous up to this point. So that would be the Vinay Ikehara, but then we put a restriction. And also that the imaginary part of S is less or equal than some, uh, it's between minus T and capital T, minus T and T, sorry. So that, so the drawing would be something like this. This you have R, this you have the X axis, your function is analytic here. And then there is a, a strip here where it can extend continuously. And that point here is R plus IT and R minus IT. Okay. So assume that, then you conclude something similar. So the Vinay-Kihara theorem will show that if I do this, then this should grow, I mean, the Vinay-Kihara will say that this grows like some constant, which will be A over R. Actually, sorry, it, could, it converges to this constant here. So what they did was to bound it above and below by two numbers, let's say U, the constant, and less greater or equal than L, the constant, where um, L is R over T divided by E R over T minus one, and U is just E R over T, R over T divided by E R over T minus one. Okay, so you come up with upper bounds. So in particular, When t goes to infinity, L and R, they both converge to one and we recover theorem N. So that's supposed to be theorem N. Okay. 
So that's the result. Okay. Any questions here in the statement? Or anything we'd be doing so far? So I know it's not a lot of information, but uh, you you can you can box it in your head. Like we have this prime number theorem, which is activable by this Vina Ikehara result, which is something about Laplace transforms. And if you remove a pole, then you have some asymptotic behavior. The second part is something like, well, we have this kernel of this Laplace transform. And then we're creating functions that lie below and above and have a bounded Fourier transform supported in the interval minus one to one. And now the third part, we want to put those two together, these two things together. Okay, so let's, uh, um, do you want to say something else? Yeah, so before we go to the proof, This is a remark. They actually make it as, as a very general result. You can actually, uh, one can actually assume, and the proof will be almost identical to some a few modifications. That you actually have a bunch A bunch of poles. Uh, this is continuous in the same range. Uh, and a similar result holds. Okay, so you have a bunch of poles with, with different singularities, uh, residues and, sing uh, and values. All of these, of course, I have to assume that uh, this guy, UM, the real part of UM is R. So actually, so you have a bunch of poles in here. I remove this bunch of poles and the function can be extended up to this part, this little bit here. Then you have a similar result, except that you're going to have, instead of this upper bounds like constants, you're gonna have some oscillations. So you're going to have here some cosines oscillating when t goes to infinity. Something O of one, but you're going to have some oscillations, okay? And this is, it has to be there, okay. This is something that can't be avoided. It's part of the problem. When, whenever you have a pole here, which is not real, so look, this guy is real, it's R. But if you have something that's not real, then that adds oscillation in that syntactic behavior. And the proof of, the, the, of these like, generalizations are almost the same, so I'm not gonna do it. Okay, so let's, let's show this result. And then we can finish. Okay, so how can we do that? So the first thing to realize that is we can assume T is one, okay? And why can we assume that T is one? Because, well, let me go back. I guess I just simply write G of S as F of T S. And then that would be the Laplace transform of T alpha uh, little T of a capital T. Okay, so you just change, the change of uh, variables, you just change the initial measure and then you see that what you get here, if you prove something for t equals one, then you do three scaling, then you prove for every t, okay? 
Alternatively, you could say, oh, I can assume that R is one, because if you see the bounds, they all depend on the ratio of R and T. So you can normalize one of them, but not both. So same, so I want to normalize T. So let's say T equals one. And the second also, you can normalize this A. I can assume uh, two, we can, can, we can assume Let's say a equals one. Because then it just divide your function by a. It just divide f by a, and then the same thing. So we would hold. Okay, but that would simplify a bit of the calculations. So then, so then you see that what we want to show. To show is one e r minus one. You do the computation, you see what you get. Um, oops, uh, e minus r t alpha t. That's so equal then e to the r e to the r minus one. That's what we want to show, and these look very similar to the bounds we got for this uh, to uh, little m and capital M. It's exactly the bounds we got, but instead of lambda, we, we have this R. Okay, so that's why they come from the, the, those functions. So now uh, the proof, the rest of the proof, is just a very long, but you could do it in one line if you had like a stretch of paper of one meter, let's say, but it's a very long uh, um, computation, but this in one line. So let me do that. So what is alpha t? So, so take some sigma greater than r, and then we will send sigma to r later on. And let h, h of s to be f of s minus one over s minus r. So here I'm already, so I normalized the, the residue to be one, and I'm assuming that t is one as well. So let me write this guy. So I want to get the upper and lower bounds for this guy. And then in, in the end, I will send sigma to R. I only prove the lower bound because the upper bound would be analogous. Okay, so what is this? Well, this is e to sigma t, integral from zero to t of the x, not dy and let me follow my notation. And then what you do, you do the trick of multiplying and dividing by something. So then we put this t minus y, and then I put e minus c gamma y here, d alpha y. So just multiply and divide it by e to minus c gamma y. Then I can rewrite that as well, if I want to rewrite in terms of the function e, this guy, if I put the function e sigma y in here, it would be good. And also in here, because the integral only goes up to t. So I can write this as integral from minus infinity to infinity of e sigma t minus y and e sigma y, the alpha y. Because if sigma is just the exponential for a positive values and zero for negative values, and you see that this, this formula holds. And then I just replace this bit here by what we constructed, the m function, but for the sigma here. So let me put a subscript sigma in the function. Okay. We do that, great. So then now I write that the thing as the Fourier transform of, I mean, by Fourier inversion. So this will be C is a two pi i, t minus y 
xi d xi, then e sigma y, e alpha y. Just writing this bit as its Fourier trans, as its, its inverse Fourier transform of its Fourier transform. Okay. And I know that it's supported in the interval minus one, one. That's why I normalize t to be one, because this was minus one, one. Okay, what we can do now, then is we can swipe the integrals. Again, why we can swipe the integrals? Because if we integrate, we can use Fubini's theorem to integrate into the thing model i. Put model i here, put model i here, everything will be finite. So we can swipe. And then when we integrate from minus infinity to infinity, let me write this thing first. Minus two pi i t x c d x c. And then the other bit, I will have this two pi i um, y x c. But we have here some sigma y as well. So this would be integral from zero to infinity because this guy only lives there, sigma y, and then uh, minus two pi i y c b alpha y. Okay, but what is this function here? This function here is just f of sigma plus two pi i c because there is this y here multiplying sigma and two pi i c. So that's the definition of the Laplace transform of that guy. So let me erase this and just write, and then it has to be inside the integral. F for sigma plus two pi i c dx c. Okay, any questions here in this, this computation? Good. Now what I will do is add and subtract this thing. So this would be integral from minus one, one, C, E minus two pi I T C H of sigma two pi I C big C. And then in here I have to put minus one one and the sigma hat E minus two pi I T C. And then in here it's supposed to be one over sigma minus two pi I C minus R the C because I added subtracted this term here on F. So it makes H to appear and then I have to put it again. Okay. So this would be, let's say the first bit, which I'm writing like this dot, 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 whatever it is, this first bit and the second integral I can rewrite because this thing here is the Laplace transform of something. So let me write it as, as, as this. This is the integral from zero to infinity of e to sigma plus two pi i c minus r. Oh no, sorry. Uh, Yes, no, this, this is correct. Um, let's see if I'm gonna use y again. y dy, and then we have dc. So this bit here is just this integral, okay? So let me continue. Then again, that first term here that I'm putting here, plus, and then I'm gonna swipe the integrals again. Uh, again, where I can do it because sigma is greater than R. So at least we have some positivity here. So this thing is gonna convert absolutely. That's why I'm taking sigma greater than R. So I can do this final 
uh, swap these final integrals. And I have integral from zero to infinity of what? E to minus sigma minus R Y. And then in here, integral from minus one one of M hat C E to minus two pi I, I say plus two pi I uh, C. And then we have what? We have, and we have minus, Oh, there was a mistake I did at some point. Oh, this is plus. This was plus because this guy is T and this is T. So this thing is plus. We won't alter anything, but this was plus. That's why I need plus. And then it should be T minus Y because this is t coming from here and the y coming from here. And this would be the dc. Term, term dy. Great. So what is that? Dot, dot, dot. Plus integral from zero to infinity, e minus sigma. And it's R Y, and then you have this integral, but but this is just the Fourier transform of this function again. So this is just M of T minus Y dy. Great. Now we can send sigma to one to sorry to R. Okay, so we deduce this, so we deduce this final bit. So this term here is this guy here, and then plus this guy. And all of this is a lower bound for this quantity. So we have alpha t, e minus sigma t, greater or equal, oh, and we send it into r. Now let's see if I can do that. So this guy, was this one? Oh, sorry. Was this one? Can I send sigma to R here? Yes, I can because this guy here H is continuous when sigma is R. That's the assumption because H is the difference. So it can send it, and also. Um, um, and also two pi i c um, wait uh, should it be two pi i c this should be from minus t to t so this is varying from minus one to one okay so this is varying from minus two pi to two pi so I should assume what that t is to pi. Um, so if I assume that t is to pi, but I don't want to assume that t is to pi. Is there a mistake at some point? Let's see. This wouldn't be a problem if I wrote everything with using the King's form. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be just C. Is that the case of this guy was F? So this guy coming from here. Oh, 
Oh. No, 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 it should. What it should do is maybe This guy and this one one two pi. I'm assuming t is one. So t has to be two pi. But if it is two pi, it's not this identity. It's not this inequality. It's something different. But it should be this one. What is the amount? Okay, so I see what's going on. Okay, I see. Okay, I see. That's not what it's supposed to be. Now I see. Sorry. It's actually the assumption is this. Okay. And that's the bound, okay. And then we get, uh, 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 yes, yes, that was, uh, that, that was my mistake. That is the assumption. And then I, mean, I can reduce T to B equals one, which means it's imaginary part between minus one and one. So this guy is supposed to be, this is because of the normalization of the Fourier transform I'm using. So I can assume T is one, so imaginary part between minus two pi and two pi. Yes, yes. Let's see if everything changes. Let's see if there is any other. Yeah, that's it, sorry. It's supposed to be two pi times something, two pi, minus two pi t, two pi t. And then I assume t equals one, which means that it's minus, between minus two pi and two pi. And now everything works as it should, because when I get, so this was the term. So I can send sigma to R, this will become r, and then c is varying from minus one to one, so two pi c. Uh, so this is varying from minus two pi and two pi, and I'm assuming that the function is continuous up to that point. So I can definitely send this to, to r. And also this function here will vary continuous for this parameter sigma here. Again, in, in, by its expression in a construction, because it's just a summation of the exponential, et cetera, you can see that it varies continuously. So then I can just send sigma to, to, to R, and I get an R here, C, E2 pi I T C, and an H R of the two pi I C, the C was the other term, which was this guy here. But when I send sigma to R, this converges to one, and the rest is a integrable function. This, this is L1. So I can definitely send that to, to, to R as well. So you can get just this. Oh, sorry, R. Okay, now I want to send T to infinity and see what happens. Oh, so there is another mistake in the, <laughs> in the statement of the result. So when t goes to infinity, what happens with this term here? Well, this term here is actually the integral from minus infinity to t of mr of y. So when t goes to infinity, this just goes to the mass of this function, which we know is, uh, one over er minus one plus. So the, this bit contributes with that and t goes to infinity. And this other bit here converges to zero because what is that? This is a continuous function from the interval minus one, one. This is also a continuous function from the interval minus one, one by assumption because this extends up to uh, two pi one uh, minus two pi and two pi. 
So, so I can put plus or minus one here. Continuous, continuous. So this is the Fourier transform of a continuous function. L1, because it's compact, it's a quartet. So it's the Fourier transform of an L1 function. So then the riemann lebesgue lemma implies that this thing decays when t goes to infinity. So this is little o of one. Okay. So that should be the inequality with this little o one. So let me go back to the statement and add a little o of one here. Little o of one here. Okay. So when t goes to infinity, you get those those bounds. So then this this finish basically the result because uh, the upper bound is similar. Let me write it here. It uses the function capital M lambda. And then you get this. Um, so this was the result that I wanted to show today. Any, any questions so far, at least in this final part? So bottom line, these, these techniques uh, of creating some of these auxiliary band limited functions are very powerful. Uh, in providing some estimates in number theory and also all the areas. Um, and there are constructions like this also, but more complicated, not very suitable for, for our class, but uh, there are constructions like this using the Brown spaces, where instead of asking that M belongs to the Pelevita space, it belongs to a certain De Brown space. This is also useful uh, in some problems in number theory. Um, but in general, the idea of using auxiliary functions, this is even broader. This is like um, um, almost every paper you see in, in analytic number theory, and there is some auxiliary functions, special auxiliary functions you have to be either is a finite uh, Dirichlet series with certain special properties, or they call a short uh, Dirichlet series, or either some other more exotic constructions. Um, in some way you have to you build something to capture the most important part and so that uh, the trash, the rest of the stuff you get is easy to control. So it's something like a filter, you create some, this function can be interpreted like a filter. You're filtering only the important stuff which was this bit that comes out in the end. And this error here is something easy to manage. It's just by the riemann back then it, it goes to zero. So, so that's the role of this, these things. And if we don't have any further questions, then I will finish. Okay, so have a good day. Bye-bye.